Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak today at Scrum Day 2022. My name is Bob Emiliani, and I'm going to speak about uh, classical management and why that uh, continues to win over Lean, Scrum, and Agile, and, and share some thoughts on uh, what to do next. Hope you find this presentation informative and uh, not too uh, depressing. Um, hopefully, you'll see it as a, a call to action. So a little bit about my background. I worked for in industry for 15 years. I was, as you can see, trained in TPS and was taught away by Shingojitsu. Uh, been in higher education for the last 23 years. Done a lot of writing and so forth. Uh, the main thing, though, to convey here is that uh, I had to make a transition from being an engineer to being a social scientist in order to um, uh, understand and solve the problems that uh, plague us both in the lean world and the uh, and in the uh, Scrum and Agile world. So what is our basic problem? Uh, well, let's look at who has interest in progressive management and who has impact. And you'll see in the blue curve, interest for progressive management is typically at the lower levels of a company. And yet the um, people who have the greatest impact on moving progressive management forward in a company are those at the higher levels. And so we have this uh, inversion, an inverted situation here uh, that um, causes us a lot of problems. We, it's very difficult for us to get traction to move progressive management thinking and practices forward under such conditions. And you'll notice on the right-hand side, Taichi Ono, who was one of the principal uh, you know, creators of the Toyota production system, um, his bosses uh, absorbed all the discontent and grumbling directed at Mr. Ono from the factory and never mentioned it to him. So the point here is that even Mr. Ono, as brilliant as he was and the people that worked uh, with him in creating a Toyota production system, people at all different levels in Toyota, uh, he had to have um, uh, uh, you know, cover by his bosses in order to move forward with uh, progressive management thinking and practices. Um, so he needed, he needed, um, top executive support even he he did so um so so this break begs the question of you know why is this situation the way it is and so um so i've been engaged in research over the last 15 years and of course draw on my industry experience to try and unravel the mystery of what's going on here and specifically looking at what i call the institution of leadership which means the social habits of mind and the common thinking of a group and much of this um, social habit of mind and common thinking of a group um, uh, dates to the late Middle Ages, but there's important elements of this that are over 6,000 years old that you know, go back to ancient Egypt. So uh, doing this research in the social sciences helps unravel the mystery of why most CEOs today, and in the past as well, uh, resist, reject, or ignore major change of any kind. Um, and, uh, and so this is documented in the four books you see on the left, of course. Now, um, um, classical management continues to prevail. I mean, progressive management, we see this in a very uh, limited way uh, in most uh, organizations, um, uh, remain committed to, to classical management. Very few organizations that do progressive management well, and by very few, I mean it's you know, single digit percentage, low single digit. Um, and so why is that? Well, classical management is, is the favored form of organizational control because it maximizes leaders' rights and privileges. And progressive management undercuts some of those rights and privileges uh, in ways that leaders uh, uh, find intolerable. So uh, we, we have a, si a situation where the, the, the status quo is very strong and powerful. So in this diagram, what you see is uh, what I call system T, T stands for tradition. Uh, the 17th century economic, legal, political, and social theory that uh, was developed at that time was to liberate uh, um, people from feudalism, which was a good thing, and it was very uh, progressive uh, back then, but over time it has aged into system T of tradition. And uh, within system T, we have subsystem CM, which CM means classical management. And then uh, we, you can see it's quite large. Um, and then you see subsystem PM, progressive management, which is this little dot. And uh, for, uh, for you know, 
as time goes by, uh, what we always see is this little dot. It pretty much remains the same. It's a little dot. It never gets much bigger. And somehow uh, subsystem CM just crowds out this uh, growth of this little dot. So essentially leaders like things the way they are and don't see uh, a need or a reason uh, to change. So what happens is uh, leaders essentially function as regulators. You see here a gas regulator. There is a high input pressure for change. You know, the employees want change. Uh, society wants change, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, but the leaders uh, uh, manage that high input pressure. And what comes out of it is a, a very low uh, output pressure, a low amount of change. So the role of the leader as regulator is to conserve obsolescence, to essentially suppress change, evade, uh, redirect change. If change is going to occur, it's going to be on the timing of leaders. It's going to be on their terms. And it's going to be, of course, in the amount that they uh, judge to be, uh, uh, you know, that they'll allow. Uh, and, and when you look at this in an organization, uh, here's an organization chart. For uh, change management, uh, you might have a different conception of change management than I do. This is really uh, no change management, ensuring that manage, uh, things don't change. Um, you see the CEO at the top and the vice presidents and the general managers and so forth. And, and everybody's uh, assuring that the high pressure for change is converted to low pressure. And so only very small changes are actually uh, achieved. And, and in a dissatisfactory way, of course, and never, never achieving the magnitude of change that people really want. So we say, um, you know, we blame CEOs. And should we blame CEOs? Well, it's convenient to blame CEOs. But in fact, what's really to blame here is a process. And it is called the social learning process. And we learn about management and managing things and managing people at a very early age in our families. Uh, the first reference to management in, the, in, the, in historical terms was in relation to the family, not in relation to um, the um, business or church or military. It was in relation to the family. So as a young child, you learn things about how your household is managed from uh, your parents. And then you learn things from your friends. You learn things from activities such as youth sports. You have a coach who is essentially a manager of the team. So you learn things there. You have teachers, how they manage the classroom. You learn things from neighbors and bosses and books and social media and society. And all this accumulates into a, 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 a picture of, of how to manage things that uh, seems rather consistent. We should do things according to the classical management way, and that results in a business as usual. Now, uh, Henry Gant, who was a famous industrial engineer, said uh, more than 100 years ago uh, that the uh, usual way of doing things is always the wrong way. So we need to think about that because he means this in the context of uh, the, way, the way the CEO is doing things, as well as the way the worker on the shop or office floor is doing things. And it's wrong, not just in terms of being the highest cost, lowest quality, longest lead time, and least safe way to do it, but it's also the most resource intensive way, the most environmentally harmful way, the most harmful way for, for human, uh, uh, human uh, health and livelihood, and it's the most stress and conflict uh, way of doing things. So we really need to internalize this and think about this, and also this would help us understand how deeply um, immersed we are in classical management and the need to move away from it. Um, the role of the leader, of course, is very important. Again, we can't blame the leaders. It's a social learning process. But just to illustrate the difficulty of getting leaders to um, engage in progressive management, we have a quote here from Frederick Taylor uh, from 1912. And as you may know, he's the so-called father of scientific management. And he said, nine-tenths of our trouble has been to bring those on the management side to do their fair share of the work. Invariably, we find very great opposition on the part of those on the management side uh, to do their new duties. And so what we see here over a great span of time 
more than 100 years, and Frederick Taylor was experiencing this in uh, the late 1800s, 1880, 1890. And of course, you can imagine that in uh, um, ancient times, there was uh, progressive-minded people who uh, uh, have the same observation as well. And what we find over this large span of time is that most leaders are not interested in improving their leadership or their management uh, thinking or practice. So uh, consequently, we just see a continuation of the status quo over a long time. And yet things are really changing now with respect to uh, the environment and population growth and resource depletion, et cetera, that uh, strongly suggests we can't, uh, cannot keep managing today and in the future the same way that we have been leading and managing as in the past. And so we are in a transition period, yet classical management still remains uh, dominant. So why does it remain, continue to remain dominant? When you, you know, uh, inquire with people why this is, you see these kinds of answers shown here on this page. The difficulty with these kinds of answers, while they're true, they represent a superficial understanding. And you really have to dig down much deeper to understand what is really going on, and I'm going to share some of that with you as we proceed with these uh, with the upcoming upcoming slides. Uh, but this superficial superficial level of understanding has been around for you know a hundred or more years, and you don't see much in the way of improvement. So so this the, the these reasons here are not moving us forward in terms of our understanding. So um, so we have two related problems. Most leaders resist, reject, or ignore lean. Uh, scrum or Agile, and, and secondarily, people do not grasp the extent and effectiveness of tradition as a near total replacement for thinking among most business leaders. So you can imagine that, or you can understand that tradition serves the role as a heuristic, and so if we face a certain kind of problem, we just do what our parents did, or we do what our boss did. And we carry this through from one generation to the next over many, many, many generations. And that suggests we're not thinking. We're not really thinking about what the problem is. We're not thinking about the possibility that there could be many, many alternative solutions and that we should try, or we should experiment and try out these many, many solutions and see what works better. And that we should periodically revisit these solutions because time passes and things change and maybe we need to uh, uh, have another look at the problem that this uh, solution uh, uh, addressed. Uh, so tradition, uh, while it can be uh, very useful for some things, is also uh, can also be extremely detrimental for other things. And this is an example of some of the uh, ways of thinking, the traditional uh, and ways of thinking and believing, the traditional heart and mind. So if we are of a traditional mindset, our heart will uh, um, uh, have some uh, beliefs such as instinct and intuition are more useful than facts. And we'll have a belief that things cannot be perfected. Whatever is, is right. We shouldn't be too imaginative or creative because we'll just get disappointed. We have to proceed cautiously. We must revere institutions. And the belief that hierarchical control is essential to the functioning of a society or of a company. And in some measure, there may be some truth to that in terms of hierarchical control, but it depends what it is. It depends on the circumstances. Uh, if you look on the left-hand side, the mind, uh, the belief that humans have limitations, that you have to support and defend the status quo, that trial and error, that experimentation is not a plan, that we have to respect traditions, that logic and reason, that's slow and laborious, it takes too long. Don't do that. We know what to do because we, ju we just do what our... our Boss did, or what we were taught in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, football and sport as a youth. Um, 
reason ignore ignore is the, reason is theoretical. It ignores real world constraints. Uh, scientific thinking is hazardous. Uh, if it works, don't experiment with it. Just do do it as it is. Um, continuous change is destabilizing. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to um, continuously improve. We want to avoid abstract the, excuse me abstract schemes such as continuous improvement. I mean that seems kind of abstract. What does that mean? And how do you do it? And so on. So what we find is leading improvement, leading in a progressive way means improving the way leaders lead. And that's going to violate tradition. And therefore that is a problem. A big problem. Now we have an in-group that um a social in-group that works very hard uh, to uh, retard advancement in management thinking and practice. So the social in-group you see on the left-hand side is a classical management in-group. And they accept the preconceptions and, and cognitive biases that, uh, that are part of classical management. And that includes overconfidence, the herd mentality, loss aversion, etc. They accept these things to overcome the facts of the matter. It's very important to understand this. They accept varied preconceptions and cognitive biases to overcome facts. Facts are inconvenient to the social in-group of classical management. <clears throat> and so when something like progressive management comes along, such as lean management or, or agile or scrum, uh, what 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 they do is they defend uh, their their in group and they'll say you know something takes too long it doesn't work etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. the hostile response that they do is to affirm their in group identity and to therefore denigrate uh, the out the uh, the out group um, <clears throat> and so what you see is on the right hand side the social out group is uh, you know. Uh, Toyota, Lean, Scrum, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and, and that social outgroup, they're focused on destroying their preconceptions, doing the opposite of what the social in-group does. They're destroying their preconceptions, uh, the economic, social, political, you know, all those categories of preconceptions. They're wanting to uh, be aware of the facts to overcome biases. So this is something that's hugely different between the social in-group, which is um, um, absorbing these preconceptions and biases, and the social out-group, which is destroying preconceptions and overcoming biases. Uh, in lean world, progressive management, or in lean world, it's often described as a socio-technical system. Uh, you find this as well, and of course, in your world, describing it as a socio-technical system. Um, leaders certainly are interested in the economic gains that come from improving processes, but they essentially have no interest in the social changes that, that Lean requires in order to function uh, effectively. They're just not, uh, uh, not, not interested in that, and hence the perpetuation of the status quo. Now, hierarchies, you know, can be a good thing. Those organizations that are um, high, highly functional and... Um, uh, um, you know, with, with hierarchical organizations. But if you look at the, how this, this works out, is that the hierarchies lead to social status, which leads to a social separation, which leads to uh, biases and stereotypes because you're socially separated, which leads to a closed-mindedness, and that in turn leads to a status quo. So um, <clears throat> the top of any hierarchy is going to shape the thinking and actions of those lower in the hierarchy, which means then they will, uh, you know, absorb and, and, and uphold the status quo. And you see some of the uh, level one indicate, uh, excuse me, the status indicators for level one people, which you are all uh, familiar with. <clears throat> um, next uh, in this slide, I'm trying to illustrate that leaders, um, uh, there's some kind of stimulus that comes to uh, the leaders of the um, organization, top leader. And there's some kind of uh, conduct that they undertake as a result of uh, that stimuli impinging upon them. And this, the conduct can take three forms. Tropism, which is an unconscious reflex. Instinct, which is teleological towards achieving some particular goal or worthwhile end. 
And then there's intelligence, which is learning uh, the acquisition and application of knowledge and skills to achieve ends. So there's action and a reaction, cause and an effect, cause and effect. Uh, so what happens is um, with, uh, um, you know, tropism being an unconscious reflex, and I'm sure you've experienced uh, giving a presentation to a top leader and getting this instantaneous response of uh, like or dislike, and that's kind of a trop tropismatic type of response. And then, of course, the instinctive reaction on what to do. We need to cut costs. If there's no understanding of what the particular problem is. <clears throat> so you'll notice that tropism and instinct are bounded by a dotted uh, 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 lines in, in black, and instinct and intelligence are bounded by dotted lines in grays. And, and there's some overlap in strength illustrate. But the, uh, the, the, the leader's conduct here is mainly in the tropism and instinct uh, uh, categories, not very little in the in intelligence category uh, because of their, <clears throat> their uh, decades of, of, of business experience and having learned through social learning processes uh, throughout their life. Uh, it leads to a very, very minimal use of intelligence and learning uh, in response to stimuli. Now, the evolution of classical and progressive management here is very interesting. What we see on the top is classical management has ancient origins. And when, when, when management is, uh, and leadership are taught, it is taught as a non-technical discipline, uh, both in industry and in higher education. Now, the important feature here is classical management is rooted in preconceptions. That is the fundamental basis for classical management. Now, if you look at the origin of progressive management, it's in the technical disciplines of engineering and science, and the scientific method and trial and error. And so progressive management is rooted in sensory perception. So engaging sights, sound, touch, you know, all the all the senses. And <clears throat> The Toyota's management system, of course, is derivative of 1880s industrial management, 1910s industrial engineering, has continued to evolve forward over time. Out of that comes lean management, and then the 1990s uh, scrum and agile, as you are very familiar with. So with progressive management, what we're trying to do is move away from this uh, closed system of preconceptions to understanding the world via sensory perceptions. And this fix and growth mindset thing is not something that's particularly uh, useful. What, what we're really uh, needing to deal with is, is, is moving from these, uh, the, uh, this world of where we're locked into preconceptions that um, have us um, locked into the status quo, maintain the status quo to sensory perception, which allows us to change and evolve uh, over time and as circumstances and need, needs dictate. So you'll know, uh, this will be familiar to you, you know, some characteristics of the institution of leadership. Uh, if you're a top leader, there's some rules to follow. These are traditions handed down for centuries. Don't go to where the workers work, make them come to you. Listen attentively to workers, but ignore what they have to say. Uh, if you respecting workers and their work shows weakness, don't do it. Never let facts impede your decision making. Create disturbances to keep workers on edge. Fear is your greatest power. Be generous with it. Always blame workers for your failures. Progress must never exceed the status quo by more than a tiny increment. Learn from others, but ignore the outliers. And of course, progressive management is the outliers. Never expect, uh, accept responsibility, even if convicted. Uh, so these will all be familiar. This, this is familiar stuff for, uh, or the, the, the way of thinking of the classical management world. So how did business leaders dress 500 years ago? Pretty elaborate, pretty ornately. How do business leaders dress today like this and even more casual? But despite the change in, in dress and other factors, the royal attitude, the mindset, the sentiments, the personal and organizational decision-making criteria remain largely the same uh, now as then. And just and think, we are just 17 generations since 1500. So it's it's not hard to understand that uh, ways of thinking today can be solidly aligned with uh, the ways of thinking in the year uh, 1500 and 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 in in centuries and millennia prior to that. 
So, um, so we have this institution of leadership, which I term uh, the system of profound privilege to contrast that with Deming's system of profound knowledge. And, uh, and there's the characteristics of the system of profound privilege um, uh, differ greatly from the system of profound knowledge, and it's illustrated in these two diagrams. If you look on the left, the system of profound privilege, it begins with deities, whoever they may be. It may be the creators. From that, descend the monarchs. And, uh, and from that, uh, various charters are given to uh, people to own businesses and to, um, to delegate some uh, political uh, leadership. And the business owners and political leaders interact, and they are um, uh, um, uh, interacting with natural rights and natural law and founding legal documents and so forth, and essentially to maintain the status quo. And again, this is uh, the system of profound privilege is built from preconceptions associated with how these uh, natural rights, natural law, founding legal documents, et cetera, are set up. Then the system of profound, profound privilege on the right-hand side begins with humans and their life processes, and we contend with uh, evolution and the ever-changing systems. We have natural senses and natural abilities that lead to curiosity, thinking, and constant experimentation and, and practical learning to uh, make progress and to assure that, that we survive. And the system of profound knowledge is built from preconception, oh, excuse me, from, from perceptions, sensory uh, perceptions, engaging things with our hands, our eyes, sight, sound, etc. Unfortunately, pra uh, progressive management is everything that most leaders do not want. This is not seen, they don't see this as an improvement in management practice. It's not an improvement in leadership practice. It, to them, it's a big flashing danger sign that progressive management corrupts classical management. It diverts attention from the unstoppable quest for gain. So, uh, so Deming said, a, uh, a bad system will beat a good person every time. And, uh, and um, I say traditions will beat a better system every time. We really need to recognize the power of traditions. Okay, so um, scientific thinking. Where does it live? Where does it die? Well, the, the uh, application of scientific thinking uh, can be across the hierarchy from president to the workers. But what we typically find is that uh, uh, scientific thinking is, there's a dead zone of scientific thinking at the you know, mid-level manager and above. And that's where the organization is led by rights, not by fact, not, not more by right than by fact. So let's just say notionally that, you know, what's going on in the uh, uh, mid-manager mid up to president and CEO is leadership by right. Now, below with the supervisors and workers, uh, in order to do their work, they have to live by the facts, the facts of the situation. They, they, don't, they don't have the, um, the status, nor do they have the um, uh, wherewithal. I mean, they just, they can't lead by right. They have to lead by facts, make, you know, if the, if the machines or the process is not running, they can't just command it to start working again, uh, as leaders do to the to the people below in the organization, they have to dig in and understand the facts of why the process failed and why it's not working and so on. So, um, uh, so this is an, another very important point that the upper parts of the organization do not necessarily want to or have to engage the facts of the matter in order to deal with a particular problem. Uh, said another way, what's going on there is um, a divide between how you run the business, which is shown in the gray area, and how you run the process, which is shown in the green area. And the mid-level manager there, you see, is the kind of the break point. And so business problems get solved de jour by right through social problem-solving processes that are external to sensory perception because these leaders are looking at dashboards and you know uh, spreadsheets and so forth. And they're mostly copying what other leaders do, again, just carrying on the tradition. Whereas the people at the bottom of the organization have to engage in scientific problem solving, 
They have to do experiments, engage sensory perceptions, search for the truth. They have to deal with the facts. Uh, you, I, I'd like to, again, look at it in a slightly different way with this diagram where we have the, the, the so-called Genba, the, the shop floor, you know, the workers' reality, uh, what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis based upon sensory perception, understanding the truth of the situation, and, and possessing the know-how uh, to do the work. And then there is a very elaborate effort to transform their reality into metaphysical representations in the form of uh, metrics performance metrics, KPIs, and things like that. And so what you see is uh, T for the transformation into a metaphysical representations. And, and the leaders of the organization, uh, 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 Sakaku, that's, that's what they're, they're engaged in. They're engaged in the illusion of reality, external to sense perception. They interpret information, they make uh, predictions, and then, of course, then make decisions. Now, leaders are under the illusion that the, um, uh, 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 the, the reality that, that workers have is, uh, excuse me, that the metaphysical um, uh, thing that leaders are engaged in, the metaphysical representation is exactly equal to reality. But it's not. The metaphysical representation is less than reality. You know, it is like if you uh, have a VR headset on, that's not reality, it's less than reality. And that introduces errors in leadership decision-making. But you see there's this, this, uh, this uh, cable uh, connecting, this, uh, um, what's the word for it? You know, computer cable connecting uh, the Genba to the uh, illusion world of the, of the leaders. And again, the, the thinking is that these two are exact and they are not. So the difficulty we face is the reproduction rate of classical management is much greater than the reproduction rate of progressive management. So people people continue to get uh, you know born and move uh, and grow up in the classical management system and social learning, and the family and so forth, and then into uh, the business world, and uh, and that uh, just increases at a much rapid rate you know rapid rate of, uh, of addition of classical management thinking, which overwhelms progressive management thinking. So I want to impress upon you the devastating power of tradition, and especially the lack of understanding of where tradition can be beneficial and where it's uh, harmful. And you have a brainy uh, progressive management, and uh, there is uh, you know, lean and agile that's based on uh, facts and, and, and perceptions that is uh, uh, dealing with the steamroller which you see here of uh, preconceptions and rights and privileges and traditions and superstitions and so forth that uh, just run us over. Um, Douglas Dowd, a sociologist, said some time ago, what's next is most likely to be determined by what is. And you can see this um, occurring now with AI systems. Uh, they're out there reading books and learning things that include all of our, our biases and stereotypes and so forth that's ending up in this uh, in this new technology. So uh, we at lower levels, we try to influence the boss, but that's a very difficult thing to do. You see in this diagram, the leaders at the center uh, and the workers are on the periphery. And the direction of influence, of course, is from the leaders out to the workers. The direction of annoyance, <laughs> the leaders are annoyed by the people on the outer periphery. That's the direction of annoyance. But there's kind of an inverse square law going here where, you know, the further out you are from the leaders, the less less influence you have. And, uh, of course, the leaders um, just uh, prefer to avoid workers because workers speak to facts and that, that disrupts the leader's uh, metaphysical world. And they're not interested in having that happen. Um, I think we can start to, you know, make a, a little bit of a controversial thing here to say the classical management is, in its essence is management colonialism. It's a policy of control by leaders over followers to dominate the cultural thinking and practice and practices in organizations. And those cultural thinking and practices span a wide range of things that you see at the bottom, social, economic, political, historical, I mean, just a wide range of things, a remarkably wide range of things. So what's the future of progressive management? Well, we have, uh, uh, you know, classical management's going to continue along. 
I don't see anything that's really going to change that. Uh, there could something could come along, you know, climate change could accelerate in a way that that um, um, forces a major change quickly. But classical management is based on individualism. The leader, it's all about the leader. Everybody's there to be loyal and support the leader. And then you have uh, scientific management, which was based on uh, the need was based on uh, sellers markets. And then along comes Toyota's management system. The need is based on buyers markets. We have to move away from a market based uh, uh, preconception of, of, of management and leadership. We need to think about uh, management and leadership based on planet, the, the, the survival of the planet, survival of the human species. Um, and we also have to contend with the fact that most, you know, 99.9% business and political leaders believe that technology alone is the answer to solving human and environmental problems. And it's not. The management, the way we manage people and things um, has a, a big, uh, a major role to play, uh, you know, on the scale of 50%, uh, technology being the other 50%. I'd also briefly like to talk for a moment about uh, factionalism. Jan Fischbach uh, asked if, me to speak a little bit about this as well. Factionalism and progressive change. What is factionalism? It's a, a party or group that is often contentious or self-seeking. Arguments or disputes between two or more small groups from within a larger group. So if, um, w within any world like Lean or, or, or Scrum there's, or Agile, there's going to be some factionalism going on. The difficulty with that, of course, is it wastes resources and it delays reaching a consensus on whatever our shared interests uh, happen to be. Another difficulty is that we become loyal to our godlike leaders in Lean world or Scrum or Agile world, and that, le that loyalty is rewarded. But the loyalty uh, uh, creates a problem in that it uh, disfavors the development of skills related to thinking and questioning things. And then speaking truth to power, you know, time passes and those godlike leaders, uh, you know, eventually what they say eventually, you know, under, has to undergo some modification. And so uh, when you when you start to bring up these modifications, speaking truth to power, that is uh, rebellious. And it uh, invites, uh, you know, being ostracized, um, move to the out group, and then that feeds continued factionalism. And uh, and then we have this problem of we cannot fix ourselves, and so we just blame other people for our problems. There is a big emotional appeal, uh, uh, you know, ideologically that keeps these factions alive, um, and and it serves, it becomes kind of self-serving to assure our continued relevance and power, and we rationalize uh, you know, it in the name of doing good. Um, so by, by having this, these distractions and infighting and wasting resources, it, it retards our advancement. And what we find is there are factions that are closest to the status quo, and these are pragmatic, less more marginalized, and better, better organized. That's important. And they have the, uh, the mindset of, you know, what we can do, um, do what we can do. And then there's a faction that's further or farthest away from the status quo that's focused on the ideal that's obviously the, therefore more marginalized. It's going to be less organized. And uh, their words that they could live by are, you know, what should we do, not what can we do. So there's an effort to try to create differential advantages here, and, uh, and that just leads to conflict. And this is an endemic to, uh, to Lean World. And in this slide, what you see on the left-hand side is a, is a table from a, a book that I wrote in 2008. But just look at the right side to highlight the, the piece here. That for scientific management, their demise came in part due to breakup into sex and, and severely criticizing each other due to clashing egos. And there was criticism based on, on merit as well and facts. And so people were forced to choose choose sides which introduce wide variation in methods and approach to implementation of scientific management and the same thing happens has happened in lean management it's broken up into sex and uh, and it says not yet severely criticizing each other that was 2008 but then you know since then that has become the case ego clashes yeah there's more of that um, advocates have been forced to choose sides, and yes, there is wide variation in uh, approach to implementation and so on.
uh, a thing to really take note of is that defenders of the status quo are really well organized and they take advantage of our disorganization. And so if we have this spectrum of factions within a world such as Scrum or Agile or Lean, uh, even though one, one, um, one faction may be closest to the status quo, well, first of all, they'll get more business, uh, more, they'll generate more sales than the ones that are further away from the, from the status quo. But the um, defenders of status quo are very well organized and they take advantage of the disorganization. And not all of this um, is, is conscious. It might not be by a plan that we're going to be well organized and defend the status quo. It, it could be that they're just so deeply um, um, aligned with classical management preconceptions of thinking that uh, it's, it's, for them it's just a, a defense that, that comes naturally. Uh, and because a lot of people are having the same defense, it looks well organized. So let's think for a moment about what we have and what we lack. We have lots of people uh, with a with a mindset of progressive management, lots of experience, energy, money, time, enthusiasm. But do we have imagination, will, and willpower? And are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to uh, uh, collapse all these different factions? So that we don't, you know, so we're aligned and together. You see on the right hand side, just some examples of, of progressive uh, management, lean, lean Six Sigma, theory of constraints, agile scrum, whatever, many more. But we lack a coordinating body. Uh, should we have a coordinating body? Should there be a think tank associated with this coordinating body? Should the coordinating body um, um, uh, engage business and political leaders to advocate for change. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to um, uh, maintaining the status quo, this is the kind of structure that you see. Um, at the bottom will be a bunch of things related to status quo that substitute for Lean Six Sigma, theory of constraints, et cetera. There's coordinating bodies, there's think tanks, and they're successful, and that's the reality. Uh, but here we are, all disorganized and misaligned, and everybody has their own idea. I mean, how many flavors of lean are there? I mean, it's it's incredible. Um, so it's not surprising that we struggle. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating for a coordinating body and think tank, but I, you know, this is this is a, a direction uh, to go uh, um, that that might have merit. Um, the other thing as we wrap up here is the level of thinking needed to effectively advance progressive management needs to be much better. You see at the bottom of this diagram on the right, classical management baseline, 1920s uh, scientific management, the effort that they made to try to move leaders forward with progressive management. I mean, yes, they, they made some improvement uh, uh, over the classical management baseline. You'll notice it's a logarithmic scale. Uh, the lean and agile of the 2000s, to my view, yeah, they did better in terms of their approach to advancing uh, lean and agile than scientific management. Uh, not by much. I'm probably giving more credit than credit uh, than is due here. But then to get to some kind of goal where you see, you know, real change that's necessary, given the uh, human and environmental conditions that we face, uh, we have a massive a gap. So. Uh, lean, Scrum, Agile are today, you know, where we are today is not where we need to be. Tools thinking doesn't do it. Behaviors thinking doesn't do it. Uh, we need much more creativity to solve uh, the problem. So let me wrap up here by saying, uh, quoting uh, Thorsten Veblen, uh, virtually all thoughtful persons will agree that it is a despicably inhuman thing for the current generation willfully to make the way of life harder for the next generation. And that's what classical management has done. And certainly since uh, the post-World War II period, which really should have been the break point of a transition from uh, classical management uh, to progressive management, we should have taken what we learned out of uh, scientific management and, uh, and the, uh, the thinking and production practices out of uh, World War II and, 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 and made that the standard off of which to evolve from. But instead, we just went right back to classical management. So we are at least 70, 75 years behind the times in terms of 
um, uh, having you know classical management in place, and uh, we've got some more uh, decades to go. So uh, with that, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope you found it stimulating, that you learned some things, given you a lot uh, to think about. So thank you very much.